I hope that each one of you had one of the uh, Connect mags this month. And uh, you'll have read a piece in the front there, which uh, I wrote actually, but um, I'm making no apology for actually com starting my, the, the message this morning by sort of rereading that in a sense. So I've got it here. I just want to read that to get us into it. Okay. I was saying it's been a busy time over the past few weeks as the different political parties have been trying to think up attractive vote-catching ideas to include in their manifestos. And while the parties may change tack at times, and there certainly have been a few changes, as the BBC News report said the other week, one thing that won't change is the daily trumpeting of policies. Mind you, that's partly the media's fault, isn't it, really? Because they get them doing they've just got to keep on doing it. But the thing is, what is a manifesto? This is the question I asked. What is a manifesto? And I looked it up from Parliament.uk. It says, a manifesto is a publication issued by a political party before a general election. It contains the set of policies that the party stands for and would wish to implement if elected to govern. So it has to be borne in mind that in many cases the policies included in a manifesto are only those the party would wish to implement rather than having a cast iron guarantee. After all, we're all human. Even the party you might vote for. So we could wonder, uh, well, you know, there's that saying, is it worth the paper written on? Or to twist that saying, is the paper they're written on worth more than the policies? <laughs> but of course, down history, manifestos have been written to state the beliefs or plans of a multitude of organisations. For instance, the famous one is the Communist Manifesto of 1848 by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. It formed the basis for the modern communist movement as we know it, arguing that capitalism would inevitably self-destruct to be replaced by socialism and ultimately communism. I looked that up, of course, on the internet. Or there's the Tamworth Manifesto. If you've heard of that, interestingly written by Sir Robert Peel in the year that this very chapel came into existence. I don't know whether it had any bearing on it or not. But uh, it was that, what it states there was a political manifesto issued by Sir Robert Peel in 1834 in Tamworth, widely credited by historians as having laid down the principles upon which the modern British Conservative Party is based. Of course, then again, though not titled a manifesto, Hitler's Mein Kampf was one, actually. It was uh, in a 1925 autobiography autobiographical manifesto by Nazi party, leader, Nazi party leader Adolf Hitler. The work describes the process by which Hitler became anti-Semitic and outlines his political ideology and future plans for Germany. We know what happened there. But many others can be found if you look through, usually, usually proclaiming something fairly controversial. I just looked through to check what the different parties <coughs> Uh, called their manifestos here. I mean, Labour calls it, it's time for real change. Conservative, get Brexit done, unleash Britain's potential. The Lib Dems, stop Brexit. The Greens, if not now, when? SNP, Scottish Nationalist, stronger for Scotland. And Plaid Cymru, Wales, it's us. But all these manifestos are merely of man's making, aren't they? And therefore, they're liable to fall short at best and end in disaster at worst. But what about the one manifesto that we all can rely upon for life? And I'm talking, of course, of the Bible, this book. God's holy manifesto for his creation. This was written, yes, by many authors, but so clearly under the direction of the Holy Spirit of God and it was written for all mankind, all mankind. <coughs> and when compiling a manifesto with all its policies, a political party first needs to be aware of the needs of the country and should be forming policies for action to meet those needs and to improve, well, the health and state of the nation, should it not? The wonderful thing is that God himself knew all along what the desperate needs of mankind would be. Forgiveness of sin, particularly, 
actually, because of that sense of guilt that everyone has. I don't believe it when people sort of seem to think that, oh, they don't, they're not worried about that. There is underneath, God has placed it in them, that sense of guilt. They know what's right and what's wrong. So forgiveness of sins. Redemption of the soul. New eternal life for all who would believe. And he loved the world so much that he sent us his only begotten, one and only Son, to pay the price for our sins, that whoever believes in him, John 3.16, will not perish, as is happening without him, but have eternal life. And he almost fantastic, it seems almost fantastic, but it's fact, that he will never fail or forsake that manifesto. He will always completely fulfill his promises that he made for his people. <clears throat> so, what a blessing it is to know that, you know, while, yes, on this Thursday, we should place our X, our cross, in the box against whom we feel we should vote for, even though we know the party they represent will inevitably fall short, don't matter what party. But the blessing is that we're remembering again this month the fact that God kept his promise fulfilling his manifesto when the Lord Jesus came into this needy, desperate world and, as the hymn says, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. I hope that's happened in our lives. Now, in our reading that we had just a few minutes ago, in Isaiah chapter 9, <coughs> as we said, it's often, this little passage is often read towards Christmas and it may be read again, I don't know, in our carol service or something, but it's about the coming king. It was written, well, probably over 600 years uh, beforehand, uh, before Jesus Christ came. But it's part of that divine manifesto which would be fulfilled in the coming of Christ. And note verse 6 in the second part of that. It says, and the government will be on his shoulders. I've always been fascinated by that. And the government will be on his shoulders. And verse 7, of the increase or the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. So we're talking about government. We're talking about government this week, aren't we? But we're talking about divine government, thus the manifesto. And Isaiah, of course, <coughs> had had the unpleasant task of warning Israel that their behaviour and waywardness was leading to a time when they would be overrun by their enemies. In chapter 8, we only read the last bit just to be able to read into chapter 9 really, but in chapter 8 it talks of Assyria, how Assyria had come up against them and as it did against the northern house of Israel. <laughs> and, and now, though it would be about perhaps a hundred years before this actually happened, to the southern house of Judah Isaiah was a true prophet and he's challenging the people while there is yet time to turn to the Lord. Chapter 8, verse 13. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. Remember the Lord. Turn to the Lord. But he knows that they will turn away. Verse 14. He will be a sanctuary, but for both houses of Israel he will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem he will be a trap and a snare. <coughs> they turned away, they tripped over him. We read that really, that of the Jews when Jesus came, that they stumbled over him. And so instead of turning to him, they were, it seems, consulting even mediums and spiritists, where we came in at verse 19 mediums and spiritists, the occult. And he's saying it will end in the gloom and darkness, verse 22, of captivity. That's what it'll be. Gloom and darkness. What a terrible thing. They were going to have to experience. But God won't fail on his manifesto, his promise. And so we have chapter 9, and it starts with that lovely word, nevertheless. I love that word, nevertheless. It takes me back in my mind when I was a little boy sitting here in the chapel here in the old days when there was a pulpit and when there were pews and so on. Just as a little boy, there was a, a, a minister preaching, I don't know who he was, can't remember now, or really uh, the, the theme of his message, but I just remember he kept on saying, nevertheless. 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 Stuck in my mind that. 
Meaning, isn't it, really, that despite all this, despite what it seems, and despite what's happening, nevertheless it's going to be different. God would one day change things and bring his people out of their gloom. So note that in verse 1, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. Isn't that lovely? I looked up Matthew Henry here, he says, <coughs> The Syrians and Assyria, Assyrians first ravaged the countries here mentioned. And that region, uh, and because he mentions here, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, which were the two tribes uh, dwelling up in the top part of, uh, of Israel. They were right at the top there. And uh, it says that, that the, the Syrians and Assyrians first ravaged that area. They suffered the worst at that point. And it was that region that was first favoured by the preaching of Christ. Because, you know, it says... But in the future, he will honour Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea. Up there in the north, that's where Jesus lived, wasn't it, where he came? Up there. And notice it's not just of the Jews, but it's of the Gentiles, because it was going to be a gospel for more than just the Jews. Those that want the gospel, Matthew Henry says, walk in darkness and in the utmost danger. But when the gospel comes to any place, to any soul, light comes. <coughs> Have we found that? Have you found that? It does, doesn't it? And, and then see, interesting, there are those two verses. In my Bible, it's at that point that I have to turn the page. And you'll notice there that suddenly, um, Isaiah is transported forward in time, as if it's now happening. All right? In verse 2, he's saying, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. He's right there now. He's moved forward. Light has dawned. Again, Matthew Henry says, let us earnestly pray that it may shine into our hearts and make us wise unto salvation. Verse 3 there, you've enlarged the nations and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoicing when dividing the plunder. And he says, the gospel brings joy with it. Those who would have joy must expect to go through hard work as the husbandman before he has the joy of harvest and hard conflict as the soldier before he divides the spoil. The Jews were delivered from the yoke of many oppressors. This was a shadow of the believer's deliverance from the yoke of Satan. The cleansing the souls of believers from the power and pollution of sin would be by the influence of the Holy Spirit as purifying fire. These great things for the church shall be done by the Messiah, Emmanuel. Great, isn't it? So, moving up to verse 6, let's just have a look at those. <coughs> <coughs> the first phrase there to us a child is born this underscores the Messiah's humanity really he had to come as a human being in the form of a child so that he can, could endure the temptations that we face men and women face and yet he would be without sin <coughs> Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, as you are, as I am, yet without sin. Wonderful. So he came as a human being. But then it says, To us a son is given. And that sort of implies, really, the Saviour's deity. He existed before his birth, as the second person of the Trinity. Philippians 2 says, Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. Yes, he came as the Son of God, God in human flesh. That's a fact. To conquer sin and death forever. All part of God fulfilling his manifesto and here it is that phrase the government will be on his shoulders that really affirms his lordship his rights it looks to the time still in the future when Christ will reign over a literal earthly global kingdom that encompasses all the kingdoms and governments of the world reference in <coughs> Zechariah 14 verse 9 says the Lord will be king over the whole earth on that day there will be one Lord and his name the only name that's yet to come in that day the government of the whole world will rest on his shoulders 
But until that time, of course, his kingdom is in an invisible form, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> Luke 17, the kingdom of God is within you, Jesus said. The Messiah's rule is over those who trust him and obey him as Lord. It's currently an invisible kingdom, but will one day become visible and universal as his rule extends even over those who do not acknowledge his lordship in, our, in their hearts. Yeah? Like those citizens in that story, although in the original it says they will be you know, cast out completely, but he will come like that king to reign, won't he? So what kind of kingdom is it? I mean, what distinguishes, really, the Messiah's kingdom from the other kingdoms of this world? Well, Isaiah uses these names for Christ that really hint at perhaps more well, like four characteristics, characteristics that make the Messiah's kingdom in every way different from any other earthly government. And let's face it, at a time when the world really is weary and despairing of political solutions, not just in this country, but you know, in other countries as well, the terrible turmoil there is in political circles there, when the political future looks bleak, this is welcome news. He's a wonderful counsellor. It can be split just wonderful and counsellor, but it can be either way, I believe. <coughs> um, wonderful counsellor. As God, God incarnate, Christ is the source of all truth. Jesus said, didn't he? I am the way and the truth and the life. John 14, 6. No politician can match that. No politician has all the truth, if any. <laughs> but it's he, it's the Lord Jesus, to whom we must ultimately turn and trust his loving rule of our lives. Many of our politicians, you know, turn everywhere else for counsel, for guidance. They go to one another, they discuss, you know, they, they have their own, even their own psychologists and psych psychiatrists and analysts and philosophers and, oh dear, so it goes on. <laughs> other human counsellors. But the King of Kings keeps his own counsel. After all, as Isaiah 40, 13 says, who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or, is it, or as his counsellor has informed him? No one. He is the wonderful, wonderful counsellor because he is God, the source of truth. I mean, if you're going to be a counsellor, really you've got, to, you've got to speak the truth, haven't you? If you're counselling someone, it's no use giving them lies or giving them made up things. You've got to have the truth. He is God. He is the source of truth, this wonderful counsellor. And when he rules the earth, there will be no uncertainty in his administration. He's the ultimate and only true answer to political confusion. It really is. But then it says that he's mighty God. Because Christ is God... He can forgive us, forgive sin. And he can defeat Satan. He has defeated Satan, but he defeats Satan in our lives as we, worship, as we serve him and as we obey the Lord. So he helps to, us to defeat Satan's temptations in our lives. He liberates people from the power of evil. He redeems them and he answers their prayers and restores their broken souls. Because he understands our deepest needs. He understands us each as to what we're like in ourselves. People may have their views about somebody else, you know, somebody may think something about somebody else, but actually the Lord is the one who really knows us. And only he is the one who can really minister deeply into our souls, broken as they may be. And there reign as Lord and we need to have him as our Lord, mighty God, over their newly ordered lives. And that's a, politi that's a politician this world has never seen, <laughs> and never will. If we truly humble ourselves from the heart, bowing to him as our Lord and Saviour, we may find the power of the mighty God unleashed in our lives to help us obey. We need to go to him continually, don't we? So, wonderful counsellor, mighty God, thirdly, everlasting Father. That's an interesting one, isn't it? 
I remember back in when we used to have the Horsham Christian Singers, I had a dear man in the choir um, from another church in the town. He was a Christian, no doubt about it, but he had difficulty with this um, in understanding that Messiah, Jesus, is called Everlasting Father. Surely that's the, you know, there's the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he had difficulty in under. And I sought to point out that, of course, in Colossians 2 verse 9, it says there, in, and we read it earlier, in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Somehow, can't explain it. I don't think Calix can explain it. And I mean, Calix, he can explain most things, can't he? <laughs> <laughs> but we can't explain it. <laughs> Sorry. We can't explain it, how that is. But it says quite clearly that Father, Son and Holy Spirit are somehow there in the Lord Jesus. It's all summed up in him. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And Messiah's government, the Lord Jesus' government, is simple and uncomplicated. He is the sole ruler, S-O-L-E, no bureaucracy, you know, no red tape, for he knows the end from the beginning because he is the father of eternity, isn't he? He's the father of eternity. He created the earth. Remember, it's, we read that the Lord Jesus was in, doing, undertaking the creation. He was involved in that. And as the father of eternity, he alone can comprehend, really, the complexities of time and eternity. Only he understands that. He doesn't need bureaucracy because he shoulders his government by himself. The government shall be upon his shoulders. That suggests, doesn't it, a bit like a yoke that everything rests on. When you say it's all on his shoulders, that means really everything is on there. The whole burden of it, uh, something and it is, it will be for him. And how wonderful that is. And wonderful that he is, as it says here, the Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. We love to come in on that, don't we? We love that bit because, you know, that's what the angels were saying. And on earth, peace. That's what they were saying. And yet, only this morning I was reading, in one of our readings, that he said, I haven't come to bring peace, I've come to bring a sword, I've come to bring... And we were reading some very serious words that the Lord Jesus had to say. But the fact remains that he brings peace to his people in their hearts. And one day, he will bring peace completely, in a way we can't imagine. But Romans 5.1 says... Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you ever stop to think about that? Isn't that wonderful? Because we've been justified through faith, because we've believed, we're justified, and we have this peace with God through our Lord Jesus. And one day there will be only peace because his government will bring that. But for those who believe now, there is peace through the Lord Jesus. So if we know him as our Lord and Saviour, he is the one who faithfully will govern our lives. Remember that song we sang at the beginning? It said, or near the beginning, <coughs> prepare the way of the Lord. I know John was doing that for when Jesus came, but it, it uses those words. Make his path straight in our lives. Open, his, open the gates. Sometimes there seem to be gates that are closed, aren't they? That he may enter freely into our life. Hosanna, we cry to the Lord. And we will fill the earth with the sound of his praise. Jesus is Lord. Let him be adored. May it be so this Christmas. Yes, we will have this man to reign over us. Hosanna, we cry to the Lord. May that be so for each one of us here. May not one person here miss out on that through disobedience, through lack of getting on with it, and in trusting him. The Lord bless us. Amen. So may we remind ourselves of those great titles again as we sing, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Wonderful Counselor, You're the Prince of Peace. Remember this one? We usually sing it at Christmas at some point, and it's a great one. <coughs> I'll stand to sing. Mm -hmm.